Thanks, Andrew, aren't they always? Well, first up, you've just announced a new round of consultations today. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Well, sure, it's great to be here. Uh, I guess most importantly, what I was here today to talk about was our continuing commitment to make sure the Trans Mountain Pipeline goes forward as planned. And one of the key parts of that is that we want Indigenous peoples to be part of the potential ownership once we move it back into the private sector. So we've announced that we are going to move forward with the second phase of our consultations. I guess, what are we doing? We're going to be engaging with 129 Indigenous peoples along the route to talk to them about how we might create an equity model or some sort of revenue shared model so they can participate in the long-term economic advantage that the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion will have for, for Alberta, for Canada, and, and for them. I've been speaking with a number of these Indigenous-led coalitions, and I know that some have submitted bids already. What does that mean for them going forward? Well, I think, first of all, what it tells us is that there's a high level of interest. We, we appreciate people submitting bids, submitting ideas, because that's a helpful part of the process. But we need, do need to ensure that we engage with everyone, that we get to a as best we can a consensus on the best model going forward and how we might do that and that means that we're going to continue to be listening we're going to be continuing to work together and we're not ready yet to sell the pipeline we want to de-risk the project so that so that we get the right value for Canadians and that we create economic advantage remembering that we're going to take that economic advantage and we're going to put it back into a transition to a clean economy so so it, it is important for us not to do that without actually having dealt with the issues around the political concerns between BC and Alberta around ensuring meaningful economic uh, participation for Indigenous peoples. So there's more work to be done. We keep hearing that word de-risk and what exactly does it mean? Because if you can't sell the project until it's de-risk, you're not going to be able to ever get rid of all the risks around this project, right? Well, it's true that there's always risk in everything that you do, but I think what we see is the, the concerns between the provinces was an important risk. The concerns that we couldn't get to uh, an agreement with Indigenous peoples was a risk. The Federal Court of Appeal decision last week saying that we had meaningfully consulted with Indigenous peoples, that was an important uh, step in terms of uh, getting rid of some of the risk in the project. But there's more to do. So uh, I think, the, the, of course, the risk will be largely eliminated once the project is in operation. It may be largely eliminated before that, but we, we still haven't concluded on a final timeline. Okay, even when we get through all the regulatory hurdles and we do the adequate consultation, of course, we still have disobedience that we're seeing with Coastal Gas Link and some members of the Wet'suwet'en. How much patience does the federal government have when it comes to these groups that are blocking railways and ports in terms of how, how far can you let it go before it starts to really impact economic activity? We're a country with laws, so that's uh, important. A project that's lawfully been approved is, is something that should move forward. But that said, we're also a country that allows people to express their points of view in, in, in ways that we agree are respectful to, to everyone else. So uh, we can expect that there'll be continuing to be people with different points of views. Uh, law enforcement uh, professionals will be uh, part of the assurance that people can stay safe. Uh, and, and we should expect that um, you know, our resolve will be to, to ensure that our rule of laws works and that, that will be our continuing point of view. I guess to put it in another way, we know there's going to be even more protests when we start to move forward with the Trans Mountain Pipeline construction, especially towards the Lower Mainland. What is going to happen and what will the federal government do if it looks as though that project is going to get pushed back further than its end date of 2022? Again, I, I think that what we have to do is ensure that we have a, rules, a set of rules that works and as things go through the approvals, as, as courts agree that we can move forward, that we're enabling these projects to move forward. But I, I do think that we accept in our country that there's always going to be different points of view. So, so that will happen. It's, it's an expectation from Trans Mountain Corporation when they gave us their uh, renewed assessment of the price last week. They also suggested that we have you know, an appropriate contingency because there's always things that we can't predict. But we're quite confident that where we're at is, is, is positive. Uh, we're, we're confident that this is a project that is, uh, that is economically positive for certain and that will allow us to transition to a cleaner economy. And we'll have to deal with those challenges along the way. Okay, so not willing to step in in any show of strength, apparently, if there is major protests? I think you're, you're asking me to answer a hypothetical. Uh, what, what we are saying is that we're a country of laws. There will be people who have different points of view. Uh, we're seeing our law enforcement professionals acting 
I think, uh, responsibly in, in the current situation. Uh, but each situation is different. Fair enough. Switching tracks entirely, let's talk about coronavirus. This is something mm -hmm. you talked about earlier today. How big of an impact is this going to have um, potentially on Canada's GDP? You know, what I was talking about this morning is, is a couple things. First of all, you know, people, people are paying attention to this. But we are in a, in a low-risk situation in Canada. Our health professionals are working well together across the country to, to protect Canadians. Uh, we will, though, see that there are some impacts. There will be impacts on tourism, on oil, on supply chains globally, and that will have some global impact. Uh, we're, we're at a stage where we can't really estimate that right now. For me, one of the things I'm doing next week is I'm off to a G20 meeting with other finance ministers, trying to look at what those impacts are and think about ways that we can you know, improve our global economy, including by reducing protectionism, so that we, we have other factors that are, that are helping our global economy at the same time. Would there be any potential for an aid package for, say, tourism and hospitality, if need be? I, I think we're, we're, we're not in any way thinking about those sorts of uh, ideas. Uh, if anything, I think that the expected impacts on Canada are, are pretty modest. It's more the global economy and certainly on the Chinese economy because they're, they're going through a you know, particularly difficult time. Fair enough. Okay, thank you so much okay. for all your time today. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Andy